What's up, guys? It's your host, Hao, here at the radio room in Ho Chi Minh City at the Viet Cetera office. Uh, we're very lucky today to have another guest on the Vietnam Innovators Show. His name is Soames Hines. He's the CEO of Ogilvy Vietnam, uh, the largest, I think, uh, creative agency in Vietnam. Uh, certainly one of the more prestigious ones, for sure. Ogilvy has a very rich history globally, but also in Vietnam being one of the first creative agencies here. So we're very lucky to hear from him about his role uh, at the organization here in Vietnam and his history uh, globally within the organization. And to, have to, to share some of the more insights about how the advertising agency uh, world works. Uh, we all know it's a bit of a mystery, but they actually play a very critical role, especially given uh, the, the rise of advertising spend in Vietnam and the number of brands trying to reach more consumers here. So Soames, thank you so much for joining us here at the radio room this afternoon. I know you're a very busy man, so we'll keep it nice and tight today while sharing as many insights as possible. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Howard. It's a pleasure. Excellent. You know, and um, we're always uh, kind of catching up. I remember the first time that I saw you was out in the smoking area below here at Centec Tower, which, by the way, we share the same building with Ogilvy, uh, Viet Cetera, that being. Um, and you're you're always wearing your, what do you call these? Uh, we call them uh, bracers. Bracers, okay. But I think the Americans call them suspenders. Suspenders, right. And yeah. um, your team is very distinctive, too, because you have those really bright red Ogilvy kind of um, lanyards that you're, you're sporting one today as well. So um, just a pro tip, if you ever want to meet someone from Ogilvy, you'll probably spot them with that lanyard as well. Um, so, so yeah, we, like I was saying, you know, we've, uh, we've caught up here and there and I, I, we're always talking about the industry since we're in very similar kind of capacities. Um, we love to just start off today's show with, you know, who you are, why you're here in Vietnam. You know, you worked 20 plus years in Asia, it sounds like. And and why now? Why here in Vietnam? So why don't we just start off with that? OK, um, so I I started with Ogilvy back in the early 80s, back in 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 London. And uh, after 10 years working in, in Ogilvy, London, Interesting, in the days when David Ogilvy used to walk around the office, so mm. I was lucky enough to meet him on a few occasions. But that was a great place to start a career in advertising. Back then, of, every, uh, of all of the jobs that a graduate could have, advertising was the most desired kind of role uh, at a university. That has changed a lot over the years. But back in, in the early 80s, advertising was where you wanted to be, and I was lucky enough to work for Ogilvy London. And came, did 10 years there, came out to Asia in about 1990, just as the Asian tiger economies were taking off. Mm. So I moved to Singapore. And I did a role there looking after regional clients, then moved to Hong Kong, did a similar thing, then to Vietnam in 93, where I opened the agency there, <laughs> a memorandum of understanding with Mr. Tan wow. from Vietnam Advertising Corporation. Is that Mr. Tan still involved here? I believe he's retired. Okay. But, but, um, <laughs> have you met him? Well, I'm guessing no, you I haven't. No, no, I haven't. haven't. Okay. I keep meaning to. Okay. Um, but back in 93, the embargo was still in place. It was very early days for Vietnam. Got it. But it was my first MD position and uh, <clears throat> was absolutely fascinating. Uh, if you compare Vietnam then to how it is now, I remember very few cars, very few motorbikes, but more bicycles than I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. It was uh, very, very different. Did you get around on a bicycle? I managed to find one of the few motorbike drivers. Okay, and he became, motorbike drivers. Yeah, he became my kind oh, of like fantastic. guide. Okay. Um, but it was, it was really, really interesting. I remember I was first came during Tet. And back then, I'd never seen anything like it. The fireworks, mm. and they were like shooting rockets down the street horizontally. Wow. Okay, yeah. Uh, Someone it, could get like... Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I was surprised that people were not being, you know, killed and injured. <laughs> but it was a very exciting time. Um, but I, I then got asked, as that had been set up, it was clear that the regulatory environment back in Vietnam in those days was such that it was going to be very difficult for an agency to really grow rapidly. Mm. And that realization, coupled with a request for me to go and open up the agency in China, in Shanghai, uh, I decided that was really... So the agency hadn't been in China at that point? No, yet. back in up those until days, that point, yeah. up until 94, all of the China business was done over Hong Kong. Mm. So all the big global clients, it was their Hong Kong offices that were or largely regional head offices back then before Singapore became more the regional hub. Everything was done out of Hong Kong. 
But the clients then started moving in in advance of the agencies, and agencies didn't want to move in because you tend to lose money when you go into You're the, setting up to setting up the yeah. business, losing money, yeah. But eventually we had to open, so I, it was a team of six of us set up the agency, and it grew rapidly, and that was probably the most exciting period in my life. Mm. That was about 94 to about 98, where every single international brand we had launched in China, um, the industry there was brand new. Um, there hadn't been a marketing and advertising industry before. So everybody was a graduate straight out of university and every client was an expat, either Hong Kong Chinese or Taiwanese. Um, but fascinating to see how rapidly the market evolved. Um, so I had some fantastic uh, years in China. And then more recently, I'd been based in Hong Kong looking after regional and global clients. So in our industry, you can either do a client role or you can do a kind of a office management, country management role. And I'd moved from country management to client management and enjoyed that enormously, working on a portfolio of clients across all the Asia markets. But it was uh, in 2019 when I thought I would continue doing these client roles uh, for the rest of my career. But I had been saying to younger people in the company, if I were you, if there's one country I would work in for the next five years, it would be Vietnam. Um, of all of the markets in Asia Pacific, I think Vietnam has got the most potential, is the most exciting place to be. And I discount China because I think the days, certainly for an expatriate of a career in China are over. Um, and so for me being an expat, uh, when they asked me, well, look, you, you've been advocating Vietnam, would you go and take over running Ogilvy here? I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that actually it's the best job going. And in spite of, you know, really enjoying the client roles I'd had, there's nothing better than running an operation, an agency operation. Um, and the big difference is the degree to which you're working with people and leading people and, and collaborating with people, um, which is incredibly challenging, but also incredibly rewarding. Um, and fortunately, 12 months in, I think this has been you know, a superb decision. Um, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm really excited about the future. Um, and so far it's going very, very well. So I'm delighted. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, you know, you note two things, milestones. One was you were giving advice to younger people or even telling yourself perhaps that if given the opportunity, Vietnam would be the most, one of the most compelling places to work in. But secondly, you know, the, the agency asked you to move here, right? So let's, let's break those down a little bit. And I'm sure there's macro level reasons why, and, and also reflective of the industry at large here, but let's start with the first one. Why, why Vietnam, um, when you were advocating for, uh, for others to, you know, consider starting their careers here. What were some signals that told you as an executive in the industry that this was one of the few places uh, where people should be really aiming to start their careers, if not yeah. develop them? I think there are a number of factors. One is growth. And, and you know, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the kind of the economic projections for Vietnam, but you've got a very, very good runway for growth here in Vietnam, better than I think any of the other, other markets. So great growth potential. Second, I think, is the, the work ethic um, of the Vietnamese, and particularly the entrepreneurial kind of startup spirit that you see here. And if you compare that to other, particularly ASEAN markets, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, my view is that the work ethic you see here in Vietnam is stronger, certainly more entrepreneurial than other markets. So you've got a great talent base to work with. you then got markets or categories that are at a really interesting stage in their development. So as categories develop, as, as a, an economy and a, a market develops, once you get to a point where the category in order to grow further needs to satisfy needs beyond the core, um, you move from a what we call a kind of a homogenous mass market to a much more fragmented and segmented market, which requires a, a more sophisticated approach to marketing. And Vietnam's at that point in a lot of its categories where it's demanding now 
more sophisticated marketing. And I think that's a great opportunity for an agency there. So the market development. And then on the personal side, um, I mean, what's there not to love about Vietnam? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got fantastic food, you've got amazing kind of places to visit. Um, so I think as a country to live, it's one of the more interesting and exciting places to be. I mean, you look at the F&B scene, well, you know, from your own experience. Yes, yeah. uh, and, and the retail environment here is very dynamic and uh, interesting. Um, so I think those things uh, make Vietnam very, very attractive. Um, and what about for the agency? You were mentioning there was an inflection point where they required someone like you who had decades of experience to come in, whereas before they, they had a more uh, different approach in terms of executive management. Uh, yeah. what, what was that turning point for Ogilvy in Vietnam? And what has what have you kind of seen, overseen over the last 12 months uh, that you've been here? Well, Ogilvy had a, a, a very kind of strong historic performance here from, you know, if you go back 20 years, it, it's grown consistently over the years. But I think you know, post 2000 and kind of 17, 18, you saw a huge change in our industry as clients started moving away from focusing entirely on, if you like, traditional advertising to doing more in digital, more in social, doing more e-commerce, more CRM, etc. Those other kind of areas of marketing. And uh, Ogilvy in Vietnam didn't shift enough to provide those services. And there's a consequence of that growth stalled. Um, and really what was needed was a complete transformation of the business from, if you like, that more traditional model to a much more kind of modern marketing kind of agency. Service. More agile, a bit more digital More agile, more digital. I mean, really around three things. Creativity, which agencies have always uh, focused on, but data and technology. Bringing those three, that kind of tri triumvirate, if you like. Uh, creativity, data, technology coming together um, and, and really rebuilding the agency around those things. And that that need here coincided with our with a global restructuring that Ogilvy is, is going through at the moment. So we have a new global CEO, uh, Andy Main, who came in from Deloitte. So from that consulting background, restructuring around five business units globally. And so there was the need for someone to go in and make some quite significant kind of transformational kind of changes. But I think it really needed someone, and certainly the company felt it needed someone with the experience of running agencies in, in other markets. Um, and I think the leadership skills needed to bring a team of people together, which is always a challenge during change, because, you know, change is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really the need for transformation, the need for experienced kind of leadership to drive that. Um, so you guys are internally innovating as well. You have to oh, transform the business, bring in fresh blood, new thinking, but also experience. Yes. Um, and you know, you're, you're saying it in a different way, but I was speaking with the chief people officer of Tiki, which is for those of you that don't know, is one of the larger e-commerce players here. And she was mentioning, uh, when Tiki was going through um, massive scale a couple of years ago and continues to. They were just areas of the business such as logistics, um, technology or data um, or search, for example, that there weren't actually uh, enough uh, talent in the local market at the very senior level who had scaled organizations beyond hundreds of people to really advise on how to maintain that scale or at least stability. And so they had to bring in a lot of uh, talent from overseas or even Vietnamese nationals who lived for overseas for a, num a number of years and you know happened to have worked at Amazon or something for a number of years and came back. So that was part of a, a really crucial part of their recruitment strategy actually to bring in some of those senior talents while mm -hmm. also elevating uh, those within Vietnam. But there's this gap where, as you were mentioning, this the macro indicators show such astronomical growth, yet there's not enough talent to kind of occupy yeah. those highly scalable um, organizational needs. And it seems like you guys um, had a bit of that as well. I mean, uh, Ogilvy is 
a couple hundred people now, if not more, um, that if I'm 250, mistaken, 250. Yeah. And how does that stack up across the industry? Are you guys one of the larger, uh, I think, yeah, lots I, of capability? Or I think we're one of the l larger, certainly creative agencies. Um, but I think the talent issue is, is probably the number one issue, I think, facing the, our industry. You guys are constantly hiring. And it's that, it's more, so there are two aspects to it. One is, that one of the advantages of having been in the business 40 years, largely with Ogilvy, is that I am able to leverage our global network. Mm -hmm. And because you cannot afford to hire all of the experts that you might need in Vietnam, but we have experts in all of our markets around the world and tapping into that expertise is really, really important. So that's part of, you know, the ability to access that deep specialist expertise that you need, that experience that you need without actually having to take it onto the payroll. That's one of the advantages of a network like Ogilvy. The second part of it is that the type of talent we need today is very different from, say, five years ago. Within the agency? Within the agency. Okay. Yes. So what kind of people are you hiring so now? So you tend to see Modern marketing today is produced by what I would call hybrids. So, you know, a creative person, but also someone who's well versed in technology. So a creative mm. technologist. Now that in, in, in days gone by, that would have been a contradiction. So you're really looking for hybrid talent. Um, and, you know, traditionally that hasn't existed in this market. So I'm, I'm of the view that Ogilvy needs to recognize that we need to go back to, if you like, what Ogilvy has always been, which is kind of the university of advertising, mm. except advertising today has changed. It's much more, uh, you know, it's much broader than just advertising. Um, it sounds we, like you guys are creating like a trainee program for that well, almost. We're going to have to um, build the next generation of modern marketing talent. I think that's what a market leader has a responsibility, if you like, almost an obligation to do. So we are going to be introducing uh, what's called the Ogilvy Apprenticeship Scheme, where we will bring in youngsters from different walks of life, from uh, universities and other places at the entry level and put them th through a two to three year apprenticeship program mm. where they can become hybrids and they can choose whichever career path that they want. Within that, and particularly important for Gen Z, and as you know, you and I have talked a lot about Gen Z, one of the things that they, that's important to them is, is the ability to be constantly learning new things. So if after six months in a role, they want to put their hands up and say, I think I've learned enough over here, I'd like to go over there, we have to allow that. So the mobility program within the apprenticeship scheme is really, really important, not just mobility within Ogilvy. So, you know, someone might be in account management, what might want to go and try working in creative. Years ago, you'd have said no. But today, if you look at how content is created, are they creative people? Are they strategy people? Are they, you know, it, the, the lines are blurred. So mobility within Ogilvy. Also, if you look at uh, exit interviews of people that have left Ogilvy. One of the reasons is because they want to get experienced client side. Mm. So our mobility program will have secondments to some of our clients. We're already oh. sending secondments. Secondments. As in, I work at Ogilvy, but you then I'll work Ogilvy, at you want to go and get some client experience. We could talk to Kimberly Clark, to Pizza Hut, to any of our sign clients. us up. There we are. <laughs> um, they don't even have to leave the building. Exactly. <laughs> so we're trying to, you know, have full mobility within Ogilvy full mobility within WPP. So we're, one of our people, for instance, this week is talking to Kantar about moving over there to get some experience in research. Similarly with Group M and Mindshare and the media agencies. So we're looking at that. And then of course with clients. Is that a global initiative or is no, that quite unique something to Vietnam? Vietnam? They're piloting it here. But yeah. I think I think it's something that other markets will, will then pick up because this isn't unique to Vietnam. The need to create the next generation of modern marketing kind of talent. Full stack mar marketers. It's, yeah. it's oh, fantastic. across most markets. Yeah, that was one of the things I was always uh, doubtful of when you know, you're know you on the client side and you're hiring a marketer. 
not an agency in particular, but like an individual marketer in house is that, uh, what does a marketer do? You know, and sometimes, uh, they're not full stack enough to know the business, uh, or they're very singular focused on like branding or, uh, you know, performance or whatever. Um, I, I do like the idea of this full stack marketer, someone that has touched upon all these different roles. And certainly from what we see of you, we, we see the same thing when we're hiring, uh, youngsters, we, we, we would pr uh, rather hire someone that doesn't quite know what they want to do yet, yeah. but they, they maybe have some interests and are willing to explore rather than someone's like, I want to be a marketer. It's like, yeah. well, th there's a lot more than just being, you know, clicking social media posts or something like that. It's much more complex. So that, that's true. I mean, I remember when I started, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about a, a, a career, okay, you're going to be become an account executive, and if you do really well, you can become an account manager and then an account director. It's too hierarchical almost. That was yeah. the career path. Now, as you know from, from uh, understanding Gen Z today, they w are kind of on this journey of betterment, of self-improvement, of exploring multiple paths, not yet defining or deciding what they want to what career path they want to follow. So you have to give them the opportunity to explore many different things. And as and when they're ready, this yeah, this is the area that I'm passionate about. This mm -hmm. is where I want to focus. Um, so it's very different from my generation, which knew that you know a career in account management is what I wanted and it would lead right. to becoming a CEO. Now, I think you have to provide multiple opportunities for people to learn different things and the need to be constantly learning is is you know really quite important mm -hmm. um so very different kind of challenges i think we face there um but uh, yeah we've got to find the right young talent and you know, is that initiative ongoing? You're hiring at the moment? Yeah, so in fact, I, I just came from lunch downstairs with our new chief people officer who joined us today. Oh, fantastic. And yeah. that is her primary focus, is on putting together a program that we call Best Place to Work, mm -hmm. which um, will take us three years, but within three years' time, we want to be acknowledged as the best place to work for Gen mm -hmm. Z in, mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam. All of Vietnam. In not Vietnam. just in just the industry, but initially 2023, the industry, 2025, uh, the whole, all, all covering all the industries. Okay. And a key part of that program are things like the apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. the mobility program. Mm. Um, I'm particularly interested in workplace experience. So, um, I'm a great admirer of what Dreamplex are doing in terms of really understanding what Gen Z expect from the workplace experience and i think if you look at what they're doing it's really quite interesting uh and groundbreaking um so we'll be moving into a new campus uh, a wpp campus where all the is that confirmed that's confirmed oh for, wow uh q4 2022 and you know so what sort of uh campus is that going to be what sort of environment is it going to be and i think if you asked that question five years ago it would be very different to what we're seeing today particularly here in vietnam um so when we move into that new office that hopefully will be the final piece in the plan so that uh achieve that goal is is regarded as best place to work and uh, you, you know we also recognize that in doing the, those things, yes, we're going to be training and, and hiring a lot of young talent, and inevitably they will leave. Um, but that's always been the case in our industry. Ogilvy or J. Walter Thompson, I would say those two agencies, trained youngsters in the industry mm -hmm. that they left. But Ogilvy has the highest return rate of mm -hmm. any any agency. So we. That's what we expect to see in Vietnam. Well, it's people good to send people out too, because they'll be your out. clients out Two in a couple years, of years. Then they come exactly. back. Um, yeah, yeah. Either as a client or <laughs> to the agency yes, itself. Yeah. We, we say that quite a lot too, when we um, think of the people we work with, obviously building that ecosystem and, and whatnot, you know, which leads me to my next question, actually, you, you talk, uh, you've discussed a lot about these internal goals and uh, what the agency is doing to, um, you know, keep up with the times and continue innovating um, in being on top of things. And how does that translate to the client work that you guys do? Um, you know, aside from offering not only creative, but data, I think you mentioned and uh, other things and CRM and all that. How's that reflected on the business performance? You know, what are 
uh, these clients expecting out of uh, all the agencies, including your, yourselves? And and what are some trends that your guys are seeing in terms of identifying um, how to uh, continue providing value to these clients, but you know, you know, be on top of things before they even know it, kind of thing. Uh, what are what are some high level trends? I think you can share maybe. Um, so I think there are. So first of all, clients are rapidly changing the way they approach marketing mm -hmm. and becoming a lot more focused on digital and, and social, particularly here in Vietnam. Social marketing Very here, uh, it tends to dominate, as you, you know. Um, so there's been a big shift there. We're seeing a lot of focus now on data and on e-commerce, and in part the e-commerce piece driven by the COVID situation. Mm. Um, but data and technology are now playing a much more important part in clients' kind of marketing approach. Um, I think most clients are struggling with building, uh, Kantar have a, a thing called brand power. They measure brand, brand power based on being meaningful, being different and being salient. Difference in Vietnam is, is a big issue. If I compare it to other countries, in a lot of categories, you see what I call a sea of sameness category key cliches, every single ad looking the same, screaming voiceover man, yep. you know. Um, <laughs> music videos. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, yes. Give me a, a music video with a rap track. Now, what's the question? Um, <clears throat> so music video, 2D motion graphics, that's kind of flavor of the month at the moment. Yep. And when everybody's doing that, nobody stands out. So I think distinctiveness, we call it, um, or, or being different mm -hmm. is really important. So that first of all, you get cut through, you break through that sea of sameness, and then to get correctly attributed to your, to your brand. So I think that's a big issue. Mm. I think category development is an issue where clients are now saying, where are we going to get growth? We have satisfied the core needs in our category. In order to get further growth, you've got two options essentially you're seeing a push for premiumization around those core needs mm -hmm. so looking at how you extend portfolios to more premium positionings but you're still at the same time looking at deeper rural penetration so you've got growth at two ends growth from premiumization of portfolios mm. and growth from better penetration of, of rural markets, which is quite an interesting dynamic. Are rural markets a, a focus for these clients these still, days? Still, still, there's, there's, there's a lot of growth still to go for, for, for most FMCG, uh, not just FMCG, for a lot of clients. If you look at, take one of our clients, Pizza Hut, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have 100 restaurants in Vietnam. Their ambitions are significantly more than that. Mm. So most clients are looking at growth coming in two areas. One is greater penetration of the more rural markets, and then premiumization. Premiumization as in you in have the urban class value, and they, as they age or get more disposable income. And you start satisfying needs beyond the core needs that consumers are willing to pay a premium for. Mm -hmm. So value added, more premium priced, uh, and that demand is accelerating quite quickly in Vietnam. Yeah, as clients are, uh, as that is now where the growth is coming in, in a lot of categories, which have kind of reached this kind of uh, sort of maturity, mm -hmm. whereby growth then comes from satisfying needs outside of the core. Oh, excellent. Okay. So uh, in terms of your client base too, I mean, um, I'm sure it's, expanding you guys are working with existing clients that you know grow their business and you grow with them uh what are some of the the new kind of briefs that you guys are coming across your table now like what what do you see are some recurring patterns is it uh brands focused on this gen z category on the you said the premiumization yeah. um what so, are some trends you, you see there so the f first thing I, I, i'd say on that is we're very much focused on our existing clients mm. That probably has been the most important factor in the success we've had over the last 12 to 18 months. Mm. And we're very lucky to have six large clients who have been with us a long time. Um, and that puts you in a very fortunate position because mm. Vietnam can be typified by 
you know, lots and lots of pitches mm. and project-based relationships. Yep. So we're very lucky there. And when you have that, you, you, you have to focus on those core clients. So in 2020, although we grew uh, year on year, we focused entirely on our existing clients and did not chase after new business. We try to be selective about the new business we go after, a more strategic kind of approach. What are the categories in five years' time we want to be in mm. and who within each category? And some of those categories are very small today. Um, Do you mind sharing what those so, categories are? So, for instance, we, we're in the process of setting up a specialist kind of startup unit mm -hmm. within Ogilvy. We have that in a number of markets globally. But I think Vietnam is the second highest startup uh, in the whole of the Asia yep. region after Singapore. Um, and some of those startups are going to become very big. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like fintech, for example. Yeah, fintech, I would say uh, financial services, mm. um, uh, telecoms. These are some of the categories that we're looking at mm. as well as kind of new and emerging categories. Um, then in terms of what clients are looking for, kind of new briefs, most, a lot of our clients are coming to us at the moment with a brand refresh mm. uh, or a repositioning of their brand. And I think post COVID, a lot of kind of uh, marketing activities or longer term kind of marketing activities were put on hold mm -hmm. as cl clients had to manage week by week, month by month, quarter by quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think that the, the realization is that we are now living with COVID. Mm. And uh, a lot of clients have now said, okay, 2021, we now have to start reinvesting. You can't us. keep waiting. Yeah. yeah. So we're seeing brand refresh or brand repositionings. Mm -hmm. We're seeing people looking at their portfolio strategies, a number of clients that are talking to us about five-year growth plans. Um, so we're seeing that. We're seeing clients increasingly interested in data mm -hmm. and e-commerce. So capturing uh, customer information, retargeting, yeah. serving them better. Yes. And... Uh, they're getting kind of tired of Facebook almost. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> or, yeah, I mean, the, this market is difficult because it's, you know, it's... So ubiquitous. It's, yeah. it's YouTube and Facebook. Right, right. Um, and... I, I've heard, though, that these um, some of these big multinational, bigger ones at least, are looking at pausing Facebook spending. Is that is that right? That's what I've heard. The likes of Unilever yeah, the, 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 it's... I, I, I don't think that's going to happen here. Mm. At the moment. It's too, too dominant mm -mm -mm. Uh, here. Um... So I don't think that's a worry. I think it'll be interesting to see what other platforms emerge. TikTok, is that, is that something that's coming across it's the table quite a bit? kind of flavor of the month. Um, and it's increasingly important. Yeah, so I would, you know. You know, right after this, we always require our guests to do a TikTok video with I us. I will do a, a pirouette for <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, excellent. I could probably stay out on YouTube there. Um, but yeah, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Mm. Um, but it is changing rapidly. I mean, if you look at the media scene here and you look at what... You, you Original guys, content's quite booming at the moment. Yeah, uh, and shows. becoming much more kind of contemporary, more modern. Mm. Uh, so I think it, the market is changing uh, and evolving. Um, but in terms of other types of brief that we're seeing... Um, Quite a bit now of new product mm -hmm. uh, launches, uh, things that were put on hold during COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you see the activity of brand refreshes and new product launches happening at a faster pace than anywhere else at any other time in your career, generally speaking, in a place like Vietnam? Aside from your the 90s in yeah. China, I guess. Yeah, right? no, nothing compares to China, where, compares where we to were launching one was, brand a week. Dear, dear God. Uh, yeah. It was ridiculous. Um, I think, I would, uh, I think in it, it's the COVID factor that I mm. think is influencing this. So, it's impossible to compare. Yeah. But yeah, because of that period of let's put things on hold until things are clearer. Now that companies are, mainly, are now getting on with things, mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a lot more activity. Okay, but I don't think more in Vietnam than other countries. How many uh, of all the international brands that exist in China, let's say up to, to this day, how what percentage of them exist in Vietnam? like 20%, 50%, oh. you know, 
uh, of international brands, you know, the likes of you know, Apple is an exception, of course, but you know, you walk down the main boulevard in like Shanghai and all these retail shops of, you know, uh, street, everyone from streetwear to electronic stores from all around the globe are there. How many of them are here? Are they, is there still- Of the international brands? Yeah, are, are there more to be kind of released in I Vietnam, you think? I. Or they, will they go through distribution? Or, I, I you know, think- Have I, we seen the end of it? Is it I, continuing? I, so if I look at what happened in China, mm -hmm. um, in the early 90s, uh, international brands were seen as superior to Chinese brands. Mm -hmm. And there was a degree of kind of aspiration associated with, with that. So international brands did very well for a number of years. And then you saw a, <clears throat> a shift that the Chinese started to feel as Chinese brands began to improve quality in particular, mm -hmm. better innovation, better at marketing. Those brands started tapping into some national pride mm. and you saw the, the big Chinese brands then becoming more successful than a lot of the international brands. Mm. And I think that is definitely going to happen here in Vietnam. We will, international brands who are not yet here, I don't believe many will successfully launch it. It's almost like too late. Too late. Or if they do, they're going to bring out the big guns kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I, th I think it is too late. Mm. Um, what's going to be interesting is how Vietnamese brands tap into kind of Vietnamese pride mm. in a in a and do that well rather than do it crudely. Um, Are there any examples of successful Vietnamese brands, perhaps in the Ogilvy portfolio or WPP at the larger yeah, level? I think yeah, there, there are many. Um, but I think what can't pick favorites on this show. <laughs> it would, would be inappropriate to <laughs> call, call any out. That. But I think you 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 you, you, you can probably can guess see a few. Of them. Um, yeah. But I think the the opportunity is, is for Vietnamese brands to better understand how they can tap into Vietnamese culture. Hmm. Um, even though they're Vietnamese brands, understanding how culture has shifted here, particularly emerging kind of Gen Z culture. To, so to get on culture, mm -hmm. uh, I think will really, really help. The other thing that's interesting is some of these Vietnamese brands then becoming global brands themselves. Mm. So uh, if you look at there's a number of big Vietnamese brands who have global aspirations, um, and that's going to be another source of growth. Uh, Excellent. Is sort of Vietnam going to the rest of the Exporting world? Exporting its, yeah. its brand. And there's some terrific brands here that, that are well placed to do that. Certainly an evolution. It started with uh, like nouns, like, you know, the bun me and the pho and whatever. Now it's evolved into actual brands. So excited to see how that uh, evolves yes. over the next five years. You know, we've been using the word five years quite a lot. Five years yes. for you in Vietnam, five years for Ogilvy, uh, employer branding wise and talent wise, five years for clients and their 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 roadmap. Um, in quick summary, we're wrapping up today's episode, so, so uh, we'll have to finish it up here. But we'd love to hear your five years in Vietnam. What, what do you hope to see for yourself in, in five years as a CEO of this agency here? Okay, I would, if I can enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed the last 12 months, then I, I, it'll be fantastic. Um, I would like in five years time to be in a kind of a chairman role, mm -hmm. um, ideally with kind of broader responsibility, either within WPP or within Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully based here in Vietnam. Yeah, you like so it importantly, here. based here in Vietnam, I don't know, I've lived in many countries. Mm. Uh, I think Vietnam is a great home for me. So I very much hope I will be here for the next five, hopefully maybe even 10 years. Mm -hmm. But to have put in place a Vietnamese leadership team that is running Ogilvy mm. uh, with me, perhaps just very light touch. Mm -hmm. um, I would like it to be regarded as the best agency to work mm -hmm. for, uh, for Gen Z, uh, for it to be our client's most preferred agency partner. Who, who, who measures best place to work? Is well, that internal? There, there is are that... a number of <laughs> bodies that measure it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was inspired by Ogilvy Sydney, who set out in 2016 to win Campaign Asia Pacific's mm. best place to work, and mm. they had some specific criteria. It took them three years, mm -hmm. but that was really the inspiration. So 
In actual fact, we will measure it ourselves rather than seeking a particular award from a particular body. But it will be a combination of things. But arguably, the most important will be client feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what we call the client agency performance evaluations. Uh, that'll be one. Obviously, how our employees feel about it. Mm-hmm. L- there'll be, uh, you know, things like turnover, retention, etc. Mm. Um so having that uh, in place, but the, mo- the most rewarding thing, I think, and I saw this when I first worked in China, is over the next five years, we're going to be hiring some youngsters mm-hmm. you know, coming in. I'd like to see what they look like in five years' time mm-hmm. and see how much they've grown. Mm. And that would be, for me, the measure of success, is to see how we've created an environment where young people can thrive, where they can become you know, the best at whatever it is they want to, to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if we do that and carry on with the plan that we've got, I think Ogilvy will be in very good shape. Excellent. And I'll be a happy camper. Very good. Living uh, here in Vietnam and enjoying life. Excellent. Well, best wishes for Ogilvy, of course, and uh, as, as our neighbor, not only our neighbor, but a influential player in the industry. So uh, best of luck, of course. And Thank you, we yeah. look forward to the, the next five years and much longer, of course. Um, that wraps up to wraps up today's episode. Everyone listening to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Uh, Soames Hines, CEO of, CEO of Ogilvy Vietnam. Um, if you're interested in learning more about their apprenticeship program or just Ogilvy at large, uh, Soames is always available on LinkedIn or reach out to anyone at Ogilvy, of course, or just drop by uh, CTY, which is a restaurant at the ground floor of the building here at Suntec Tower. Uh, where we're actually filming from as well. You can always see Soames in his red lanyard. Uh, Thank you so much, Soames, for your time this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to having you back on in five years. (laughs) Thank you very much, Ham. Check out the Vietnam Innovators series on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to listen to other innovative stories in Vietnam. Thanks for listening to another episode of Vietnam Innovators, brought to you by our partners, health tech startup GeoHealth. They're best known for their doctor at home services, but offer much more than that. If you haven't already, check out their mobile apps on the App Store and Google Play for more, or drop by for a visit to their new smart clinic at M Plaza in Ho Chi Minh City.